Well, praise the Lord, everyone. <clears throat> After the death of Solomon, because of Solomon's sin, because in his old age, his foreign wives led him astray, and he began to build places for pagan worship, even the sacrifice of children to Moloch and Shamash. Interesting, those temples and those idols were across uh, from the temple the, of God, right across on a mountain. So they were facing each other. It's just a tragic thing that happened. God appealed to him twice and said, Solomon, you know, right? cut off again. <laughs> Be faithful to me. And, uh, but Solomon continued on. And because of that, God says, I'm going to take the kingdom from you. I'm going to tear it into two kingdoms. But I'm not going to do it in your lifetime because of your, your father David and how faithful he was. So after Solomon died, his son Rehoboam became king of Israel. But true to God's word, God split the kingdom. And there was an uprising because Solomon wanted to build, he, he built the temple of God. And it cost so much money. And they taxed the people so much that people were having a hard, a difficult time. And it wasn't just the building of the temple, but it was also his palace, the building of his palace for himself. And so after Solomon died and Rehoboam became his son, Rehoboam became king, then uh, the people rose up and they came to the elders and they said, listen, we are taxed to the limit. Will this king, you know, ease our burden? And the older men went to King uh, Rehoboam, and he listened to them, but then he consulted his young men, his young advisors. And his young advisors were offended by that request. And so... They said, don't give in to this. You need to be a strong king. You need to let them know who's boss. And so you tell them, and he did, where my father whipped you with whips, I will whip you with scorpions, meaning I'm going to put more burdens on you. And that was a very sad thing to say and a bad thing to do, but it was God's will because it was going to split the kingdom. So 10 tribes left under the leadership of a pretty wicked man called Jeroboam. He became their king. And he made priests of the lowest class of people in all of Israel. Now from that time on, when we see in the Bible, Israel most always is talking about the northern ten tribes. And the house of Judah, or Judah, is the two tribes that remain, Benjamin and Judah in the south. The, the capital of the southern kingdom of Judah was Jerusalem, which had been the capital of all of Israel. And Jeroboam made Samaria in the land of Ephraim. And if you don't know who Ephraim is, Ephraim is the, the youngest son of Joseph, of the two, you know, uh, he had an Egyptian wife. And Joseph was the most esteemed, you know, by God and by his father. And he's the one that received the birthright. And he had two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. But God's, when, when Jacob came to bless the two children, his two grandsons, he, and because Joseph said, all the children that you have after these two will belong to you. But these two I adopt. So they became known as half-tribes of Israel. But they are known also, when you see the tribe of Joseph or a blessing in like Genesis 49 and 50 about Joseph, it's talking about both of them. Now what God said was that he 
see, he switched. When, when Joseph brought his two sons, he brought his oldest son, Manasseh, to Jacob's right hand. Jacob couldn't see. He was blind at the end of his life. And he brought his oldest son to his right hand to receive the greater blessing. That was Manasseh. And he brought his, the younger brother, Ephraim, to the other side, to his left hand. But Jacob, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, crossed his hands and put his right hand blessing, the greater blessing, on the younger. And Joseph saw it and he said, no, father, that's the younger son. But the father, being blind, knew because the Spirit had moved him to do that. And he said, I know, son. And, he, and you're, this son, Manasseh, will be a single great nation on the earth. But his brother will become a whole colony of nations on the earth. Now, who does that sound like to you? Does that not sound like the United States and the, the, the European, not the European, but the, the UK, the British Commonwealth that colonized the entire world? You know, the British used to say at the height of their power, they said the kingdom, the sun never sets on the kingdom of Christ, our King. Because somewhere, the sun was shining on a British colony. The British colonized more nations, more places than anyone else in the entire world. South Africa, East Africa, uh, the Caribbean. Uh, the United States was a colony. We were a British colony. We were under King George, you know, when the Revolutionary War began. We rose up against the, the, the king and the empire of Britain. And they came and tried to force us, you know, to, into uh, submitting to their power. But God gave us providence because it was time for a single great nation to rise upon the earth. So now when you read in the Bible the prophecies coming against Israel, understand this. Israel and Jacob is the same person, the same people. Jacob's name was changed to Israel when he wrestled with the Lord in the wilderness of Penuel. And the Lord had to take his hip out of socket because he was saying, bless me, I won't let go. Then the Lord changed his name from Jacob to Israel. So Jacob and Israel is the same, is the same. Now, listen, this is very important. <clears throat> the end time the great tribulation that comes upon the whole world is called in Scripture the time of Jacob's trouble. It is, now, it's trouble coming upon the whole world, but the target is Israel. Now, Israel is both natural and spiritual. Amen? There's a spiritual Israel. You know, the Apostle Paul said that Gentiles, it doesn't matter if you're a Gentile or not. If you're born again, you're Abraham's offspring and you're heirs of the promises of Abraham. We find in Romans chapter 9, it is not the children of the flesh who are regarded as the descendants of Israel or as Israel, but it, it is those born according to the promise. You see. So there is a spiritual Israel that began with righteous Abel. And then there's a natural Israel that began with Jacob. We could say Abraham, but the Bible says Abraham is the father of us all. Now, Israel is the first fruits, the nation Israel is the first fruits of the nations. Amen. But we, spiritual Israel, those born again, descendants of Abraham by the Spirit, born of the promised seed, which is Jesus Christ, we see in Galatians chapter 3. We are the Israel indeed. Paul said in Galatians chapter 6, he ends his letter telling the Galatians, you are the Israel of God. Earlier in chapter 4, he tells them that they're Abraham's offspring indeed and heirs of the promises. So it's not the children of the flesh who are the, the true spiritual Israel of God. Now, spiritual Israel preceded natural Israel. It began with righteous Abel. You know, Jesus called Abel righteous. So he, he was righteous. He is going to be a part. He's listed in the great cloud of witnesses who have gone before us. Now think about it. In Hebrews chapter 11, the great cloud of witnesses who have gone before us, those were in Christ before Christ. Jesus said this. He said, 
He said to Philip, he said, uh, you know, you believe because you have seen. But blessed are those who have believed yet have not seen. Now listen, he's talking about people like Abel. He's talking about people like Noah, like Sarah, like Rebecca, like, like Ruth, he, like uh, Abraham, that they couldn't look back and see Calvary. They couldn't look back and see the cross. They couldn't look back and see a provision made for their salvation. They had to look ahead and live by faith and believe that there would be a provision made. Amen? That they had to look ahead and say, I, I believe, I don't see it with my natural eyes, but I believe and receive by faith that God will provide a sacrifice for me. On the hill called Moriah, God provides Calvary in the New Testament. So that's, that's what they believe. So now listen, when you see those prophecies about Israel, and about this, this time of trouble that's coming upon Israel, understand this. That's not talking about that little country across over there on the Mediterranean Sea. That's not talking about where Benjamin Net, Net, Yahoo, who we love, was just prime minister, but he got beat this last time. We're, we're not talking about that little nation. That's Judah. That's a remnant of Judah. They're the Jews. You see, Israelites were never called Jews. Jews comes from the tribe of Judah. And Judah means praise, the praise of God. Now, uh, so Judah and Benjamin stayed, and of course the sprinkling of the Levites were everywhere, you know. But, but the, the ten tribes in, were in the north. Now, understand this. God said that of Abraham, the reason he changed his name from Abram to Abraham is because Abram means father. Abraham means father of many. And he said, I change your name to, from Abram to Abraham because you will be the father of many nations. And because of that, all nations on the earth will be blessed by you. But that's talking about the gospel. We see that in Galatians chapter 3, I think verse 10, where it says there that uh, the gospel was preached beforehand to Abraham in that all nations will be blessed by him. Because the promised seed, which is Jesus, that saves the whole world came through Abraham. Amen. Abraham and Sarah. It had to be both of them. Amen. It couldn't be Hagar. It had to be Abraham and Sarah because she was a part of it too. She was chosen as well. So they became many nations. Now, listen. The two tribes, the northern kingdom of ten Israelite tribes known as the House of Israel, became very wicked. Most of you read about it. Listen, when you read the book of Kings, First and Second Kings, and First and Second Chronicles, it tells a story. It gives you the the, the chronological history of the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah. And if you notice, so-and-so became king of Israel. And while so-and-so was king of Israel, so-and-so, somebody else, was king of Judah. Two separate nations, two separate kingdoms. The first time that Jew is even mentioned in the Bible, they're at war with Israel. So we shouldn't call all, I mean, Israel is Israel, and the Jews are Jews. And the Jews are called Jews because it was predominantly, Benjamin was a very tiny tribe. Very, very tiny. They got almost wiped out by the rest of Israel over an infraction years earlier, hundreds of years earlier. So, you know, they were uh, a very small tribe. Judah is a very large tribe. And Judah is the tribe that was given the scepter. That means the rulership. That's why David who was a Jew from the tribe of Judah, will be a king. That's why Jesus didn't come as a Levite. He didn't come as a, a Josephite. He didn't come as a Reubenite, you know, or anyone else. He, he came as a descendant. He was born into the family of David, who is a Jew. So Jesus is a Jew. So Jesus, you know, as in the natural, has no right to be a priest. But he was a priest already from the beginning 
as Melchizedek, you know, with no beginning of days, no end of, the, end of days. And the priesthood of Melchizedek, by which we are now born into, preceded that of Levi and Aaron. Amen? It existed before. And this was added later. There's a priesthood to the natural Israel, and there's a priesthood to spiritual Israel. And in fact, we are the priesthood of Melchizedek. And we see that in the book of Hebrews, chapter 5, 6, 7. So we know that we are of the priesthood of Melchizedek. First uh, Peter chapter 2 says that we are the church, a royal priesthood, kings and priests. Revelation chapter 2 and 3 tells us repeatedly that we will sit on thrones and rule with Christ for a thousand years during the millennial reign of Christ. We have a crown. We will wear a crown and we have a throne. And we will sit on a throne. Whether that's literal or not or not, I don't know. But it does mean that we will carry the authority of a king. And we will be kings and priests under the king of all kings and the priest of all priests, which is Jesus as Melchizedek and as the great I am that's coming. So that's going to take place. Now, in 721 B.C., because of the wickedness of the ten tribes in the north, God warned them over and over and over and over again and said, if you do not repent, I'm going to send the mighty Assyrians upon you, and they shall be my scourge to scourge you. And they will take you away. And it's a, it was, nobody wanted to be under attacked and conquered by the Assyrians. There's no one in history like the Assyrians. The Assyrians were the most ruthless, uh, cruel of all empires that we know. You know, if you ever watch Star Trek, if you ever watch that show, you ever seen that? Well, you know, the Klingons that are always, they're always, well, they're the Klingons of the ancient world. That's what they're like. They're just, I mean, it, all it is, is it is a culture of brutal warfare and conquering. I mean, that's what, they glorified that as brutal. And the, the ten tribes did not repent. And in seven, well, earlier than that, he began sending the Assyrians in, and they were conquering cities. But the capital city, of course, is Samaria in the land of Ephraim. You want to know why Jews hated the Samaria, Samaritans in the New Testament? It's because they knew that the Samaritans were not even Israelites. Now, they were at this time, but later on during the time of Jesus, they weren't. And I'll explain but here in 721 B.C., 721 years before Christ was born, uh, <coughs> the Assyrians came down upon the northern kingdom and they have conquered uh, Samaria and the whole kingdom. Now, what they did is they carried all the people that they could get. I mean, there's probably a few people that escaped, but they carried them all away as slaves. The Bible talks about it. I've seen the boss reliefs on the wall of which they themselves carved, you know, showing how, what they did. Well, I saw one of, of the city of Latish. And, and what they would do is, and, and God said they will, they will carry you away with hooks. And that's what they did. They had these big like giant fish hooks and they would put them through people's lips or put them through their nose and have a rope on them. You'll go wherever they want you to jerk on you. They would take you wherever. They did that with everybody. They were very, very, very cruel. And there, it showed that in, in their, they glorified that in their uh, carvings on the wall. And then it showed like a long line procession of, of warriors, Assyrian warriors, each one of them holding a severed head of an Israelite coming up wait to show their king you know that what they had done to the enemy of Assyria so they they were absolutely brutal and so they were the Israelites the northern kingdom almost the entire nation all of them that they could capture which was almost everybody they carried away as slaves and they took them over to the northeast 
by the Caspian Sea. And that's where they put them to work and labor there. Now, so what happened to those people? Because, listen, that's Israel. Now, God had promised Abraham that his descendants would be mighty nations on the earth. That his, they, they wouldn't just be a people, they would be nations. He called them a whole colony of nations. Many nations will come from you. Well, where are they? Now, they're over there by the Caspian Sea. Now, let's forward a little bit. Well, that's quite a bit. Let's forward to about 800 years later. 800 years later, just after the death of Christ, there was a great Jewish historian named Jose Flavius Josephus. And if you don't have his works, you can buy it. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's quite comprehensive. Um, it, it gives a lot of insight that we don't get in the Bible as to why God would be angry about certain things. Some of the details that God may, or writers of the Bible may have left out, he fills in. Because it was handed down by oral tradition. He explains why it was such a grievous thing for Nimrod to build the Tower of Babel, what they were really doing, and what Nimrod had sworn to do as an enemy of God. And that they were making it waterproof. They weren't just putting mud in between the bricks like you normally would in the desert, arid place. They were using tar. So they were making it, you know, they were saying, we don't trust you, God, that you won't try to destroy us again with a flood. And so we're going to build this tower so we can get to you to make war with you if you ever try to do it again. That's, it was an act of defiance, and that's why God had to divide the languages and stop the building of that, because it, it is a symbol of rebellion. Incidentally, that is on the cover of the European Commonwealth's welcome uh, invitation, Invi welcome to, in, to join the United, to the, the United States of Europe the European Commonwealth. On it is Peter Bruegel's, a Dutch painter, his rendering of the building of the Tower of Babel. That is actually on the cover. And it's not finished. And then uh, it says there, many tongues, one voice. Exactly what God was against. He had to stop that. Well, now they're building Babylon again, you see. And so when... The European Commonwealth became the Commonwealth. They had, just like the end time beast has two capitals, just like Rome had capital in Rome. The Roman Empire had a capital in the city of Rome, and they had a capital in Constantinople, named after Constantine the Great. It's called, it's in Turkey, it's Istanbul, Turkey now. But then it was split kingdom. See the two legs of the statue, as we'll see. And Daniel too. So, <clears throat> um, so on this, that when they built a new $12 billion parliament building in Strasbourg, France, for the e e EU, European Commonwealth, they literally made it uh, as a replica of the Tower of Babel being built by the painting of Peter Bruegel. They delivered it, make, made it look like it was still in construction. It's finished, but it looks like it's not complete. And it is a tower. If you go inside that building and look up, you see the sky. And all the offices and the built, you know, rooms are on the outside. That's what you find as a capital of the EU. Tell me they're not the beast. Oh, yes, they are. Now, you know what we find over in, Be in Bl Brussels, Belgium? Brussels, Belgium is the other capital. They have two capitals. Strasbourg, France, where this building, that's a replica of the building of the Tower of Babel, and in Brussels, uh, Belgium. And you know what they have sitting outside the front door, the openings of the door in the court out front? They have a woman riding the beast. Yes. That's at our website. You can go to our website where it's under the articles, The Beast Arises. I've got pictures of it. And that's not all. They, look, there's a woman riding the beast. And the beast is a black bull. And in reality, in mythology, it was a white bull. 
And the woman is Europa, by which Europe is named. And the story goes in mythology is that Zeus, the god Zeus, was, the Greek god Zeus was looking down and saw this beautiful woman sleeping by the seashore of the great sea, the Mediterranean Sea, and saw that she was beautiful. So he came down, and he turned himself into a beautiful bull, a white bull, and he laid down beside her. When she woke up, she saw him, and then she rode him, but he jumped into the great sea, went to the island of Creek, raped her, where she gave birth to those mythological half-human, half-animal creatures, you know, that are there. So the very name of Europe comes from the rape of Europa. Now, in the early uh, 1900s, right before World War I, the Germans got obsessed with the occult. They got obsessed with uh, ancient artifacts. They were in hot pursuit. Hitler continued that, wanting to find the, the, the spear of power. If you don't know what the spear of power is, it is the, the spearhead that lanced the side of Jesus. Because it was believed that whoever possessed that could rule the world. And they were looking for the chalice or the... the, um, the um, a, a holy grail, which is the, you know, the, the cup of redemption that the disciples, that, that Jesus gave the disciples. Look, they were looking for all this, and they were looking for the Ark of the Covenant because it's the most power object, powerful object that's ever been on this planet is the Ark of the Covenant. And they were looking for all this. Now, they went into Turkey. We find in Revelation chapter 2 and 3 where Jesus writes the letters to the seven churches, his seven churches, you know, and there's a church called Pergamum, and he, he says, I know where you live. You live where Satan dwells, where his seat is. That was well known at the time to be the temple of Zeus. There was a temple of Zeus there in Pergamum, Turkey, and what, and what they would, and they, there was a big altar there that they sacrificed on. Now, that was Satan's seat. That's what God called Satan's seat, and, and John called it there. Jesus called it that. The Germans, before World War, I, World War II, I, went in there, excavated that, and brought it back to Germany. And they reconstructed it, made it in a side of a, 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 they built a museum for it, reconstructed it, put it in there, and you know what the name of the museum in Berlin, Germany is? Pergamum Museum. Yeah, Pergamum Museum. And you can go to this day, you can look it up on the internet and literally see the seat of Satan. And then when Hitler came to power, he actually had a replica of the altar made, a big square altar. And if you see him outside doing those speeches where everyone's mesmerized and he's working them up to kill the Jews and to go to war, he's standing on that, the seat of Satan, you see, a replica of the seat of Satan. Now, that's not the only thing they did. They, they went and into Iraq and they excavated the, the Ishtar, the Ishtar wall, which is the Babylonian wall. Beautiful blue uh, wall. It's gorgeous. And it has all these uh, symbols, these animal top symbols on them. And there's 336 of those, I believe it is. That's the number. You know, in, in Hebrew, numbers have letters. And letters have numerical value, just like Roman numerals. And Roman have letters, but they have num numerical value. Value also in the Hebrew is called the Jamatra. You use Hebrew letters to come up with a number. So there's always that question when you're talking about the number of the beast. Is that talking about use Roman numerals because that's who's going to be in power, uh, revival of the Roman Empire, or is it the, G the Hebrew Jamatra? We we don't know. I mean, I don't know. Somebody might know. I know God will reveal it before it's all over to somebody that's got wisdom, but. Anyway, they brought that wall, they brought the wall and the gateway by which Daniel had to pass through. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had to pass through. And it had 336 figures, demon 
uh, animal demon gods on it. And 336 in, it spells out in Hebrew, hell. Yeah, it's a number for hell. So the Jews call, commonly called that gate the gateway to hell. That's what they, they went through it. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel had to, they were carried as captives through that gate. The Germans went, excavated that, brought it back, put it in the Pergamum Museum. Those two things are in the Pergamum Museum. And then the, the capital of the E, of course, Germany is the head of the EU. And then you've got Strasbourg, France, you've got the capital, a building of that as a replica of the building of the Tower of Babel, the ultimate in uh, rebellion against God. And then in Belgium, Brussels, Belgium, you've got the woman riding the beast, the rape of Europa. So there has to be every kind of demonic spirit that is at work there. Now, after Germany did that, guess what happened? They started World War I. And then not long after that, World War II. You see, do you not think those demons and the devil is working? Do you not think the spirit of Antichrist has been working there? That the spirit of Antichrist is saying, I want to rule the world. I'm going to take over. I'm going to rule, rule the world right here, of course. And God has been standing in the way. But you know what? He's about to just step out of the way right now. If he hadn't already, I think he probably already has. I just saw yesterday where this doctor I really trust a lot. His name is Clark. He's in the UK. And I found him to be quite reliable and balanced. And yesterday he said the latest indication for COVID-19 is that it's not, it's not really a pandemic. It's endemic. Which means it's just going to be present. It's not going to be a pandemic that passes. It's endemic. It's going to be present at all times. It's just going to be there at all times. And he said, no one will escape it. And then we don't know what variants will come from it. This is probably the beginning. The Bible tells us in Zephaniah, speaking of these last days, that the sword is without the sword is coming after us. And pestilence and famine are within. And that's where we are. I don't think we will ever be normal, probably again. And here's the thing. It's dividing the world. It's dividing people. Uh, you know, Biden gave a speech Friday. I think it was Friday. Maybe it was Thursday. Uh, maybe it was Thursday. It was Thursday. It was Thursday, was it? He gave a speech basically saying that this is all blamed on the unvaccinated. The unvaccinated is to blame for it all. And then he, he put in mandates saying if you have employ any business that has employees over 100 people, they have to ha make, make sure every one of them is vaccinated or they have to test them every single week. You see, so it's creating a tremendous problem. And people are being, he's dividing. And that's what the devil does. We're being divided. Now, <clears throat> so Josephus said about, I was saying about, you know, the Assyrians coming in 721 B.C., before Christ. They came and took the ten tribes. And they took them over by the Caspian Sea. Now, by the time Josephus came along and Jesus came along, the ten tribes had been gone. Now, you might... Jesus actually, and I think it's in Matthew chapter 10, he actually sent his disciples. He sent them. He said, I'm sending you to the lost sheep of Israel. Now, he's not talking about the Jews. They were living among the Jews. He's talking about the lost sheep of Israel. He's talking about those who are the descendants of those who were carried away by the Assyrian Empire. That's what he's talking about. And he said something very, very interesting. He told them, and don't go by the way of Samaria. Now that was his way of saying, the Samaritans by, by, largely are not the Israel, the lost Israel. They were carried away. And the Assyrians put 
other people that they had captured in those cities and in those the work the lands the, and and the people that were already their slaves they put them in there you see and so the problem with the Jews having with the Samaritans was that when things were going good with the Jews the Samaritans say ha, we're your brothers we're family we're kinfolk and but when things weren't going so well and the Jews had lost favor with whoever was in power then, then the Samaritans and those of the northern kingdom up there, and the Samaritans is just, you know, the capital of the ten tribes. But they'd say, oh no, we, we're not even related. You know, we were just put here by the Assyrians and we've worked the land ever since. We're not even from the descendants of Abraham. So they knew that, you know. Of course God, I mean, with Jesus, it really didn't matter because he came to save sheep. He has, he has sheep of, he went to the woman at the well in Samaria, amen. She preached the gospel to the Samaritans. And so he was calling Samaritans, no matter what tribe or what nationality or what peeps. You know, there's only one race, the race of man. But there's many cultures. You know, a lot of we, there's a lot of cultures in the world, a lot of religions in the world. So anyway, so Josephus said, 800 years after the Assyrians took the northern kingdom, he said that they were, he told where they were. They were up above. They had moved westward toward Europe from the, the Caspian Sea. And he said they were, he just stated it as fact, like we know where, where they are. They're up there. And, and he said they are an innumerable multitude. But they didn't have, they were living among other nations, you see. But they eventually migrated into what we know as Egypt. France is probably from the tribe of Reuben. Um, the UK is Ephraim. Well, Britain is Ephraim. Then you have Ireland and Scotland, which were part of the other tribes too. And you have the Scandinavian countries. You have Canada. And you got the United States, which is Manasseh. Now, the reason why all that matters is because Satan is going to, first, his first target is spiritual Israel. That's us, the saints of God. His second target is Israel. Israel and the Jews. But he's going to deceive the Jews because they didn't receive Messiah. And so when he stands, listen. Now listen to what's going to happen. Why do you think Revelation chapter 13 says that there would be a second beast, the first beast being the Antichrist, a second beast that would come out of the earth, a second beast that would tell the whole world, would do great signs and wonders, even bringing fire down from heaven and tell everyone to worship the first beast. He will be telling, he will be like John the Baptist, probably claimed to be John the Baptist, the great Elijah that would come, you know, before not John the Baptist, but you know, Jesus said John the Baptist was Elijah. But the Elijah that would announce the coming of the Lord, we find that in Malachi chapter 4. Well, someone's going to come on the scene, and they're going to do what John the Baptist did with Jesus, behold the Lamb of God. This man's going to say, behold, this is the Lamb of God. This is the Messiah. And he's going to do great signs and wonders. And he's going to even bring fire down from heaven. Now, why would you bring fire down from heaven? If he's claiming to be Elijah, what if at the temple, a rebuilt temple, that he stands there as a priest at the rebuilt temple, as Elijah, and he says, see this altar? You know, you can't build a fire on the altar of God. God God had to start the altar at the tabernacle and the priest had to keep it going. If you build it yourself, it's strange fire. God will not accept it. So, you know, at the altar, when the temple was built, the fire had to be kindled all the time. It kept going because if it went out, you couldn't build it. Fire came from heaven. Fire came down from heaven to the altar and started the fire at the tabernacle and also when Solomon dedicated the temple when he built that great temple. And they had to keep it burning at all times, you see. So the fire, you can't build the fire. So can you see this man claiming to be Messiah, Antichrist, in place of Christ, saying, I'm the Christ. I'm Messiah. 
The Jews will say, yeah, we've been waiting for you. Oh yeah, they will, because they didn't receive Jesus, you see. And so, and this man comes upon the scene, the second beast, and he does these great wonders. And he said, this man is the Lamb of God. I testify, I am the one crying in the wilderness. I am the one testifying of he who is to come that would take away the sins of the world and would bring, and bring the hearts of the fathers back to the sons and the sons to their fathers, as we see in Malachi 4. And then he says, to prove it, put wood on this altar at the temple, in the courtyard of the temple, and saturate it with water, just like Elijah did at Mount Carmel. And I'll prove to you that not only am I Elijah testifying, I am the one who came crying in the wilderness, testifying who is, that, who is the true Christ, and he is, I'll prove it to you that I am he, that I am the coming Elijah, and he will call fire down from heaven and come and start that altar. Can you see that happening? Why would he, Revelation chapter 13 says he will bring fire down from heaven. It doesn't tell us why, but what did the first Elijah do? It was to, it was to start that fire on the altar that would have been saturated to expose Man, listen to this. To expose the priest of Baal, if God, if Baal is God, worship him. But if God is God, if Yahweh is God, worship him. This proved, and then, listen, there was a great slaughter. The people, the people that saw Elijah do this, and the priest of Baal couldn't do it. They tried, you know, for half, they they danced around, cut themselves, and praying for their God to bring fire down from heaven. It didn't happen. But Elijah just prayed, and it came down, and that happened. And as soon as that happened, all the people turned on everybody else. You know who everybody else is going to be? You. You're going to be everybody else. It'll be everybody that says that Jesus is the Messiah. You see? That's who. Do you want to wonder why when we find both in Daniel 7 and Revelation chapter 13 that the beast, the end time beast, will make war with the saints of God and overpower them. We find in Revelation chapter 5 and 6 that, that the blood of the altar, altar, the blood of the martyrs will cry out from the altar. How long? How long? Will you not avenge us? And the Lord will say, until the rest of your fellow servants are killed. But there are going to be people who are going to be protected. People who are accounted worthy. Jesus said in Luke chapter 21, he said, pray that you would be accounted worthy to escape all these things. Revelation chapter 12 talks about the woman. The woman is not Israel. Some people say it is. The woman identifies who it is. It's, it is Israel, but it's Israel, the church, not Israel, the nation. You know, it's talking about the woman and prevail and get about to give birth and the great dragon, which is Satan, waiting there to devour her. But the, the, but the Lord gives her wings on the great, uh, of a, a great eagle and sweeps her away to a place. And the dragon comes against her with a flood, which is probably an army like the Egyptian army came against Israel at the Red Sea. And it says, but the earth helps a woman and opens up and, and the flood sw is swallowed up by the earth. And then it says, and the woman goes into the place of wilderness. Now, how do we know that's not natural Israel? Because it says, this, her, the remnant of her seed, which were not accounted worthy to be protected, the, the devil goes after them because they're not protected from the face of the servant for the last three and a half years before Christ's return. And during the great tribulation of the day of the Lord, they won't be protected. He will go after them in great wrath. And it's, it identifies who they are. Those who keep the commandments of God and hold the testimony, hold their faith in Jesus. Now the Jews may fancy themselves as keeping the commandments, but they don't hold their faith in Jesus. So that can't be talking about 
natural Jews. Of course, there are some Jews that are Christians, but it's talking about Christians there. Amen. So the church is going to be protected, but the Bible says that this is a time, Malachi chapter 3 tells us, that, that God's people and his priests are going to be purified and purged at this time. You see, we're either going to allow God to purify us now. You know, I mean, it's going to happen. If you're called by God, and if you've received the Holy Spirit, there is no escape. There is no escape from that. His calling is irrevocable. You're going into these last days as the enemy of the forces of darkness. That's just the way it is. Amen? He sees you as an enemy. And so he's, he's coming after you. He sees the Spirit of God in you. He's coming after you and everyone who you love. And everyone you hold dear. He's coming. Now, Jesus said, pray that you be accounted worthy. Be so doing. Be faithful in the little things. And I will be with you. We can. There's not a rapture. You know, where you go to Jesus comes secretly. That's just not even true. The Bible says that he comes secretly to the children of the night who are asleep. <laughs> but his coming won't take the children of the day by surprise because we'll be alert. But there's going to be, you have the parable of the ten virgins. Five of them, went, they all went to sleep. But five of them weren't prepared. Five of them, you know, weren't, but they didn't have their oil. And they didn't get in. They had to leave and go get oil. When they came back, the door was shut. You see, and that's going, that's a picture of what's going to happen. And Jesus gave that parable, you know, right after the Olivet prophecy in Matthew chapter 24. And after the end of chapter 24 saying, you better be ready because you don't know what time, day or hour I'm coming. You better be ready now. Best not be messing around out here in this world. You better be ready. You better be focused on me because I am surely coming. And you do not want this day to take you by surprise because it's going to be a time like no other time in history. It's going to be a time when all flesh would perish, Jesus said. All flesh would perish. And some people say, well, it doesn't matter if you keep the Sabbath. You know what Jesus said? He said, when you see the, if you're in Judea, during this time, when the Antichrist comes in and the false prophet comes in to do his thing and they put a statue in the temple, the abomination of desolation, Jesus called it, standing in a place that has no right to stand, let those you, your, my followers who are there, get out. Don't even go in and get your coat. You get out. Get out and flee to the hills. Flee to the mountains. Because their time of trouble is coming quickly and a time like no other time. And pray that your flight would not be in the winter. Because it's hard in the winter. Israel has a winter. And are on the Sabbath day. Now listen, some people say it doesn't matter. It's going to matter to the people there. It's going to be, I mean, that's God's people. If Jesus, if Jesus is saying it doesn't matter, the Sabbath is not still holy, why would he tell people to pray that the flight from Antichrist would not be on the Sabbath? He's making the distinction between that day and all other days in the Olivet Prophecy. That hasn't even happened yet. And somebody telling you that the Sabbath is done away with, it's not done away with when Antichrist shows up. See, it's not ever going to be. We even find that the Isaiah chapter 66, that even after a new heavens and a new earth, all mankind, a new heavens and a new earth, when this earth is gone, this creation is gone, and a new one comes, it says all mankind will, will come to worship me from Sabbath to Sabbath. That's what it says in Isaiah chapter 66. So there's something about the Sabbath that's an, an eternal thing with God. It's just not... It's not just having to do with this creation and this earth. He, he gave it here. He, he instituted it here because it was already something eternal. It was already, already something with his, in his nature and in his realm. Amen. So they were conquered 
by the mighty Assyrians, the northern tribe. Now, about 125 later, years later, Judah continued to sin. God sent prophet after prophet. They mistreated the prophets, killed some of them, and they did not listen. And eventually God then said, this is what's going to happen. He told it through Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. And it was difficult. He was mocked. False prophets were saying, he's a liar. Everything is going to be fine, O king. Don't worry about a thing. Your enemies are going to be handed and, you know, given into your hand. You don't have to worry about it. That's what the lies that were being said. They, they put Jeremiah in stocks. They mocked him. They slapped him, you know, and everything. You know what Jeremiah said? He Listen, prophets have an unpopular message sometimes, most times. It's difficult. You know, there's a lot of prophets in the church. That's one of the gifts. One of the gifts in the church is the gift of prophecy. And in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, Paul said, pursue all the gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. And I think, you know, you know, in the church we had before it split, we had a lot of prophets and prophetesses. And it was testified by their prophecies. And, you know, they weren't prophecies like Old Testament seer prophecies. Mostly had to do with what the church needed to do. God was speaking to the church. This is what you need to do to be ready. And I pray that the spirit of prophecy falls on every single person that ever comes through here, through those doors. Because there's nothing greater than the gift of prophecy. The gift of prophecy is, is the right now word of God. You don't have to look it up. It won't be contrary to what the word says. It will be confirmed by the word. But you'll have a new, you'll have a different understanding. You'll say, well, I didn't know that was there. It was there all along. That's the way it usually works, you know. But, you know, when the gift of prophecy, usually when, when someone has a real when they have a real prophecy, man, if you have the Holy Spirit, you recognize it right off the bat. Yeah, I, I hear the Lord speaking right there. So prophets came. You know, Jeremiah had the, the unpopular message of having to tell uh, the southern kingdom, Judah, northern kingdom's already gone 125 years earlier. Nebuchadnezzar, you're, you're going to be given into the hands of Babylon. And Nebuchadnezzar, their king. And you as well, just God's not going to change his mind. He's not going to have mercy. When you get, you know, those of you who are carried away there, he didn't carry everyone away. He carried only the nobles, the ones that he could use, like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and some of the others. People that he could use in his administration. Uh, professionals, you know, maybe physicians, that type of thing. He, he, he skilled people. He brought, he sent those away, but he left people in the land. But he came and he took Judah. He burned the temple of God. That tells you what God, this beautiful, now this is Solomon's temple. One of the wonders of the world. The number one wonder of the entire world. The beautiful Solomon Simple, just gold everywhere, beautiful, stunning, perfect. And God just let them come in. And they, you know, that shocked them. They thought God will never let, he will never let anyone come in. You see, listen, what good is a house? What good is it going and giving sacrifice? If you don't obey God, if your heart is far from him, what good is it? Honestly, what good is it? Oh, yeah, they were doing daily sacrifices. The other priest was going in on every atonement every year and going through the veil with his own blood, with blood for himself and blood for the people, making atonement for the people, all of that. But you know what God said? He said, I don't even care about all that. You know why? Because I, you, your heart's not in it. Your heart's not with me. And I don't care about that. I care about mercy. I, I care about you taking care of people. You taking care of the widows and the orphans in the land. 
and not taking advantage of people. That's, that's what I care about. I want a people to purify their hearts, you know? And so he said, I don't, I'm, I don't even care for those because your heart's not in, even in it, you know? And so they came and they took them away. And, you know, God said that I will allow a remnant to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. And it was during the Persian captivity because the Medo-Persian Empire, the Medes and the Perch, Persians had come together and they conquered Babylon and conquered, and they attacked Babylon and conquered Babylon. So the first beast was Babylon. In Daniel chapter 2, we see that Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. And he called all these wise men in. And he says, I want you to tell me the meaning of this dream. Tell me the dream and its meaning. And they said, well, you tell us the dream and we'll tell you the meaning. He said, oh, no, I'm too smart for that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you'll make up some interpretation about that. The only way I'm going to know is for you to tell me what I dreamed and what it means. They said, well, nobody asked for that. There's no king ever asked for something like that. And he said, well, I am. Well, we can't do that. And he said, well, I'm going to have... I, then he made a law where every wise man in the entire nation was to be executed on one day. Well, the word came to Daniel. They came and got Daniel and said, hey. And he said, they brought him in. And they said, well, there is a, there is a man in the kingdom from the exiles, from the Jews, who has a divine spirit. And so he came in and he said, I don't know, king, but Lord knows. I will pray to him and see what he does. Well, he gave him the dream and the interpretation of the dream. And because of that, of course, that exalted Daniel. But here's what the dream was. The dream was looking and there he saw a great statue of a man. And the head was gold. And the chest and the belly uh, was uh, silver. And then from here down to his thighs was bronze. And then from the, the knees down to the legs were iron. And then the feet, the toes, were partly iron and partly clay. And then as he was looking, wondering what this statue might mean, he saw that there was a stone cut from heaven. And it comes down, and that's Jesus. And it strikes the statue on his feet. And then all the statue falls and then to pieces. And then the wind comes and blows it away like chaff. And so what Daniel interpreted it, and this is very important for us to know. He said, you, O king in Babylon, you are the head of gold. But after you, another kingdom will come inferior to you. And that was the Medo-Persian Empire that conquered him. And then... That was the time when Daniel, uh, you know, was under Darius the king and under Cyrus the Persian, the Cyrus the Great. And it was under Cyrus that they let the, uh, the Jews go back to start rebuilding the temple. You read about that Ezra and in Nehemiah. So <clears throat> then he said, and then after, and then after the head of gold, Babylon, and then the Medo-Persian Empire, another kingdom will come. That's like brass. And that's Greece under Alexander the Great. And then there was another one. It would be a split kingdom because it has two capitals. Rome, Roman Empire had a capital in Rome and had a capital in Constantinople. Two capitals. They called it the, the, the Western and the Eastern Empire. They ruled the known world. And it was iron in as much as it breaks everything down, you see. And then there would be a revival of the fourth. See, not a different one, not a fifth kingdom, but a revival of the fourth. In Revelation chapter 13, it says that the fourth beast will suffer a fatal head wound. Maybe that's real. Maybe the Antichrist will actually be assassinated and be dead for three or four days and the the false prophet will raise him back to life, like Elijah raised the child back to life. You know, that could happen too. 
Not just the fire down, comes from down, but do the works of Elijah. That may happen. Or it could be that it's just symbolic that, you know, an empire had lost power and came back. Or it could be both. It could be a dual prophecy being fulfilled, you know, which so many, so often does happen. So, uh, so he's, now, during the revival, there's ten toes. And these toes are partly mixed with iron and clay. And it said, these kings, these nations, they don't really mix well together, but they've come together, but they don't really have anything that, that keeps them, they're not blood related, you see. They're, they're coming together as something else. In this case, it's a trading block. Get it? You, you, European Union, what do they do? They trade, they buy, and they sell. See? What does the, the beast, you have to have his mark in order to buy or sell. It, it is a trading power, you know. And he's going to claim to be Christ. The Jews are going to believe it. He's going to sit in the temple. They're going to think he's the greatest thing. And the Bible calls Jerusalem uh, Babylon in Revelation chapter 18. The woman that rides the beast is not a church. It actually says, the woman you saw riding the beast is a city. That's what it says. And then it says who, and then it says the ten horns. Who are those? Those, those hills are ten kings. That's what it says. They're not like somebody is, or seven, seven kings. You know, you see where the, the woman is over seven, is like surrounded by seven hills. And I said, well, that's, that's uh, Rome because it's the city of seven hills. Did you know that Jerusalem is also surrounded by seven hills? Yes, it is. But that's not what it's talking about. The actual says the seven hills you saw are seven kings that would arise. And then it's names later on. And the city who you saw is Babylon. Now, that's not talking about Babylon and Iraq. That's talking about Israel. That's talking about Jerusalem. That's what it's talking about. Now, you might think, how would we know that? Okay, that happens, right, in chapter 17 and 18. What do we find in chapter 11? The two witnesses of Revelation 11. The two witnesses. You know where it says that they prophesy? You know where it says where they are killed? You know what the Bible says? It says they're killed in a city called Sodom and Tyre. I believe, right? Tyre and Sodom. No, Egypt. That right? Let me look. <laughs> but it's two pagan cities. Amen? Let's get that. Let's just make sure we got that right. Uh, Sodom and Egypt, that's right. And when they had finished their testimony, now this is the two witnesses of God, and they, and they will give their testimony the last 42 months, three and a half years, that's during the last part of the tribulation and the, the last year of it, which is the day of the Lord. And it says there are the two olive trees that we find in uh, Zechariah chapter three or four. <clears throat> they have the power to shut up the sky and, and to, so that it will not rain. Verse 7, And when they finish their testimony, the beast that comes up out of the abyss will make war with them and overcome them and kill them, and their dead bodies will lie, notice, in the, in the street of what? The great city. What do you find in Revelation chapter 17? The woman is called the great city. The great city. There's only one great city. That's Jerusalem. Notice. And their bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which is mystically called Sodom and Egypt. But now notice, where also the Lord was crucified. Where was the Lord crucified? Was the Lord crucified in actual Sodom or Jerusalem? Was the Lord crucified in actual Egypt or Jerusalem? So, here in Revelation, God gives mystical names to Jerusalem. The great city, the great city is called Sodom and Egypt in chapter 11. 
And in chapter 18, it's called Babylon. <clears throat> now, um, so we find that during the time of those last empire, the revival of the fourth empire, God will establish a kingdom. And that's what, that's what uh, God told the king. I mean, God told Daniel and Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar. Then during the time of these kings, God will establish a kingdom that will crush all of these other kingdoms. In other words, bring down all of man's world ruling empires and they will fall and crush and be blown away. And then that rock, which is Jesus, will grow into a mountain and become a whole, will, the king, it will be a kingdom that fills the whole earth. Amen? So that's what we're looking at. Now, let's go over to, we're going to go over to uh, Daniel chapter 7. We'll read in Daniel chapter 7 here in a minute. So now let's just go over Daniel chapter 1. Daniel is taken to Babylon. You know, after um, Judah is conquered by Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon, he's taken to Babylon in order to serve the king. And he becomes an important part of his administration. In chapter 2, uh, we have what I just uh, paraphrased, and that is Nebuchadnezzar having that great dream of a statue, and that statue being destroyed by a rock from heaven, the rock, Jesus Christ, the rock of ages, coming down, smashing the statue on the feet because that's who is in power at the time. During the time of these kings, that Nebuchadnezzar's dead, Cyrus, Darius is dead, Alexander the Great is dead, Caesar is dead. It's the time of these kings, the God of heaven, will set up a, a kingdom and destroy all of man's kingdom and his kingdom will fill the earth. That's what we see in chapter two. Chapter three, I want us to understand this. We know the story. Nebuchadnezzar was talked into um, having a great statue built of himself. And he was being worshipped as a man, God, king, you know, as a, as a god in the flesh, like so many of those pagans, dictators had, had been. And so, and then the decree went forth, whenever uh, the music would sound during the day, everybody was to bow to this statue, in the direction of this statue, wherever they happened to be, you know, in the city of Babylon, they were to bow. Well, you know what the story is, is that it happened to where, you know, the music sounded, everybody bowed, and there were three young boys that didn't bow. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, three Jewish kids, and they wouldn't bow. But they were very wise and very important to the king. You see, they were a part of his administration. So the king didn't want to kill them. But the news came to him and said, you've got three who are rebellious against you. They're not doing what they said. So this king did, this God king did what he would have never done to anybody else. He said, hey, boys, listen, maybe you didn't understand the rules, so I'm going to give you another chance. Um, you know, when the music sounds, just bow down. You know, just bow down and everything will be fine, you know. So he's giving them a second chance. That just didn't happen. And so, and they're very bold. They say, well, King, uh, we're not going to bow down. <laughs> you see, our God, we are not to bow to another God or to the image. We don't worship. We don't use graven images. So we're not going to bow down. And our God is able to deliver us out of your hands. But even if he doesn't, if he chooses that we die this day, let it be known to you, we're not going to bow down. And the Bible says in chapter 3 that he was so enraged, that he was so angry, that his face literally was distorted. He was that mad. And they had this furnace. 
And he said, I want you to heat that furnace up seven times hotter than it ever, ever has been. And I want you to throw these boys in there. And the, and the guards that threw them in there, the fire killed them. It killed them. And then they could see, walking around in the furnace, in the flames, was four people. The three boys and someone that looked like a god. Yeah. Someone that was like shiny. Kind of had a countenance. Shining. And they said, wow. And Nebuchadnezzar called out to them, come out. They didn't even smell like smoke. There wasn't a hair singed. There wasn't any. Their clothes weren't uh, burned. Nothing. And they came out. And you know, it was a great thing. But I, I want us to not miss I want us to not miss something here. There was an image. Because mostly we're talking about, and rightfully so, we're talking about the courageous and faithful acts of three young boys. And we want to do that. But understand this, that they were dealing with an image. And Nebuchadnezzar was a top of Antichrist. He's a world ruler. He was the first world ruler. You see what I'm saying? The first. There's going to be a revival of the fourth. And this one is going to crush the entire world. And will be, he will be killed by Christ when Christ returns. The Bible says Jesus will slay him with the breath of his mouth. You see, in Revelation chapter, the end of 19. So there's a statue, you see. When Antiochus Epiphanes came through... Epiphanes means in the flesh, God in the flesh. So it was a king of the north, a descendant of Alexander's um, Seleuc uh, uh, general called Seleucid. He was a descendant and he became king and he was a top also of Antichrist. And he put a statue in the temple of God. It is the abomination of desolation. Now listen, listen. When Jesus said at the Olivet Prophecy in Matthew chapter 24, he said, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel. See, well, we find the prophet Daniel in chapter 11 tells about this king of the north who was a descendant of Alexander the Great, one of his four generals. Alexander died at 30 years old after he conquered the world, and he, he divided his empire among four. And there became two very prominent ones, the Ptolemies in Egypt. Ptolemy was the name of, uh, of his, one of his generals. And Seleucid was one, Seleucus was one in the north. And so they warred with each other, and they came to the Promised Land. And so the king of the north under Antiochus IV, who took the name Epiphanes, Antiochus Epiphanes, meaning I'm Antiochus, God in the flesh. I am Zeus in the flesh. And I want a statue of me in the temple. And people were supposed to bow. You see, this is what has always happened. You see what I mean? It's not going to be different. It's going to happen the same way. We'll say, well, that'd be too obvious. It's always been obvious. This is good. The COVID thing is obvious, but it's happening. It's just going to be that way. Satan sometimes works right out in the open. Sometimes people don't believe what they actually really see. They have to think of something else, you know. But <clears throat> so let's take from chapter three that God's people were expected to bow at an image. Now, you can make all kinds of loopholes in your mind. You can say, well, you know, we're supposed to uh, respect authority, and God told us, you know, that he, God put Nebuchadnezzar in power, and then, you know, I mean, after all, he made this, and I guess, you know, uh, there's a lot. Well, that's what's going through the people, people's heads. All kinds of things like that, you see. So, we have an image there of someone who is a top of Antichrist, Nebuchadnezzar, a top of the end day empire as the beast in Babylon, the first one, and he used an image of himself, a statue that people had to bow to. Now we find that 
The end time beast will have an image, an image that will speak. Revelation chapter 13 says this image will speak and will declare who it is that doesn't have the mark. It's a spiritual thing. I don't know how that's going to work, but I think there will probably literally be. What do we have right now? In Brussels, Belgium, we've got a statue. There is a statue out front of a woman riding the beast. It's right out in the open. Something else maybe you don't know. But throughout Europe, there are these statues, these big iron statues or bronze statues in cities where they're grotesque. But they, it's like a man dressed, you know, in a, you know, like with a vest and a jacket, and but the head is a is a is a hog, ugly hog. And you know what those the statue is called, the beast. Yeah, those statues are called the beast. Now in the in that. The beast is supposed to depict the ugliness of racism, you see. That's what they're doing it for. But just think about it. Just the idea that you would have a statue that you would call the beast throughout Europe. And you have on one of your capitals, you have a woman riding the beast. The other capital is a building that is built of a replica of a painting of the building of the Tower of Babel. You know, I mean, this is not an accident. Then you put together the Ishtar Wall. You put together the, the, the uh, you know, the seed of Satan. And then what happened with Germany, you know, with World War I and then World War II. And it's been that way ever since. And so it's going to be that way. So there was a statue that has been used, we know, throughout history. It was used in the temple, you know, uh, by Antiochus Epiphanes. And by the way, that's what Hanukkah is about. Hanukkah is about uh, the miracle of when they... They removed that statue and they, they, def they drove them out under uh, Judah Maccabees. And, they, and the Jews drove them out. And, uh, and they went in, they took that statue out, but they had, they had uh, sacrificed swine's blood on the altar. So it all had to be cleaned. And you couldn't use just any oil, any olive oil in the lamps in there. And it's dark inside there. When you go inside, it's dark. I mean, there's no windows, you know, inside the temple. And it's covered by a veil that's six inches thick, you know. So it's dark in there. So you have to have light uh, in, in both the holy place and the holy of holies, you know. And the, and the, the, uh, the veil separates, you know, the thick veil separates the two. But the other one also has a veil, you know. And it's dark and there's, there's no windows in there. So you have to have light. Of course, there's no lamps in the Holy of Holies because God himself lights is the illuminate there. But in the holy place where you had the, sh uh, the um, you know, the, um, the um, table of incense, you've got the showbread, you know, you've got the, the candles, all of that, you have to have light. Well, they only had enough for one day. And so God performed a miracle and it lasted eight days until more oil was consecrated in order to use. And that was have to do with that statue being removed and the temple being rededicated and made holy again. So in chapter three, that kind of tells us how the devil is working. See, he's used statues before. He used it with Nebuchadnezzar, the image of something that's other than God in place of God, instead of God, Antichrist. Now we go to Daniel chapter seven, and these are the, the four beasts. Now here we find that here in verse um, two of chapter seven, Daniel said, I was looking in the vision by night and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. And the great sea is a Mediterranean sea. And that's important because that's where these kingdoms come from. Every one of them is on the Mediterranean Sea, the Great Sea. Somebody said, well, Russia's the beast, China's the beast. That's silly. The beast has already been here. It was called Rome, the Roman Empire. It's the same united Europe that will be revived in the last days. It's not going to be somebody else. It's going to be the same one. 
Now the first was like a lion and had the wings of an eagle. And I kept looking and its wings were plucked and it was lifted up from the ground, made to stand on two feet like a man. And a human mind was also given to it. Now, this is just a re-description uh, of what we read in chapter 2. These are the same four ruling empires and then a revival of the last that will be here when Christ returns. So the lion is Babylon. And the, the bear is a, is a Medo-Persian empire. The leopard is Greece. And then the fourth, which is exceedingly strong, and Daniel wanted to know. See, Daniel knew, wow, this fourth one, he's probably talking about the revival of the fourth one, the end time, is different than all the others. Well, what would be different? If you're Daniel and you're looking at war, here you see horses, you see spears, you see arrows, you see some of these catapults, you see these things, but you fast forward to the revival of the fourth beast, you say it's exceedingly dreadful, different from all the other beasts. You tell me how our modern military and the weapons we have today are vastly different than what, what Daniel saw when he saw the lion, when he saw the bear, when he saw the, the leopard. In other words, when he saw an ancient Babylonian army sweeping the world, an ancient Medo-Persian army sweeping the world, an ancient Greece army under Alexander the Great sweeping the world, and an ancient Roman Empire sweeping the world with spears and swords and bows and arrows and catapults and things like that. And then you fast forward to the end time and you see mushroom clouds and you see missiles coming from, you don't even see a, a, a plane. A drone up above takes you out. Did you know that, that there's no need for any facial recognition? Although I wonder about, you can't trust those big tech, high te you know, big tech companies because they're in bed with the, with the liberals for sure. But you know, I have facial recognition on my phone and I use it. And I thought, you know, it's 30,000 points that they use. And so they know my face well. I mean, you know, if they, that's recorded somewhere. You know it is. Amen. That's recorded somewhere. But you know what I saw during the Afghan, you know, war? I saw our drones take out individual people from 30,000 feet. I mean, they're up there flying where a, uh, you know, a, super, uh, a, a 747 is flying. They're way up there, way out of sight, way out of, you know, you don't hear nothing. Boom, you're dead. And they didn't have any facial recognition for these people. Didn't need it. You know what they had? They had recognition. They have body language recognition. I saw it, I saw it explained on the news, the regular news. How do we know this was who he was? Because no one walks exactly like he does. No one walks like he does. No one, you know, tilts his head like he does. He has a game. Everyone is unique in how your body moves. And they can determine that. They, they just recorded video of this guy when they knew it was him. And they could see him anywhere, anywhere. And they could just take him out. And that's the technology we have today. What did Daniel see? I mean, what in the world did he see? I mean, what did John see? He saw this abyss and these machines or they come out of this great abyss and the smoke and they had the power. You know, the, the wings were like the sound of a mighty wind. You know, they, these are machines. These are maybe drones. There's nanotechnology that size of a mosquito could be on that wall and it's a machine. You and I would never know it. It could be recording everything we say, watching us, filming us. That's all there right now. There's no getting around any of that. You know, they have nanotechnology that they can put inside your body. They have little tiny machines, you know, and they're, and, and they're growing fast more and more with that. So, <clears throat> So this lion is Babylon. It is the first of the four world ruling empires. Listen, 
when the last beast, we already know already that, because the Bible actually identifies who they are. Okay, we don't have to guess. The Bible identifies, you know, Daniel said, you, O king, you're the head. So we know that already. And one will come after you. Well, we know who came after him, who conquered his empire. That's the Medo-Persian empire under Darius. And then later uh, Cyrus the Great of Persia was king. You see a joint merging of two empires. And then after that, we know what happened. Alexander the Great came and it talks about that in chapter eight. The very next chapter of chapter seven, it talks about the goat and the ram and it tells us who they are. The ram with two horns, one bigger than the other, is the Medo-Persian Empire. The Medes is the smaller horn. The Persians are the larger horn. And the, the, the goat comes across, that's Alexander. He's got a great prominent horn, that's him. That's the king. And he smashes and breaks the horn of one of the horns of the, of the sheep. And he conquers him and tramples him underfoot. That literally happened, you can read about it in history. You can read about that in history. Alexander came against Darius. Darius fled, he went after him, he killed him. They just decimated the largest army in the world. Alexander didn't have a great big army, but he was a brilliant strategic general. And he conquered, but then he died. So his empire kind of died, it was split to the four winds. And then Rome came to power. That's the fourth beast, it ruled the world. And so there will be a future revival of that fourth beast. Verse five, and another beast, the second one resembling a bear, and it was raised up on one side, and three ribs were in its mouth between its teeth. And thus they said, arise, devour much meat. And I kept looking, and behold, another one, like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. See, those four heads of the leopard is his four generals. Amen? The four generals that took the kingdom after he died. And then now notice verse 7. Then I kept looking in the night, and night vision said, Behold, a fourth beast, dreadful, terrifying, and exceedingly strong. And it had large iron teeth. Now, all these others just had teeth like a regular animal. Just teeth. Now, this one's different. We're talking about something, he's looking ahead and he's seeing an end time beast that would be like iron, that would be, you know, had instruments of steel, extremely strong, had iron teeth. It devoured and crushed and trampled down the remainder with his feet. And it was different from all the beasts that were before it. And it had 10 horns, just like the 10 toes. See in Daniel chapter two. And this beast will be in power when Christ returns, you see. And by the way, all these beasts are Gentile kingdoms. There's not gonna be any Israelites, not America, it's not Britain or anyone else like that. It's a Gentile empire, always was. And while I was contemplating the horns, behold another horn, and this is Antichrist, the beast. He's also called the man, the beast. The beast is an empire and the beast is a man. A little horn came up among the other, the other 10 and three of the first horns were pulled out by the roots before it. And behold, this horn possessed eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth uttering great beast, right, great boast. I kept looking until thrones were set up and the Ancient of Days took his seat, that's the Father. His vesture was like white snow and the hair of his head was pure wool. His throne was ablaze with flames. Its wheels were a burning fire. So interesting that God's throne has wheels. Do you see that? And I mean, I wonder kind of, uh, they're probably cool looking. I kind of like the idea of wheels. Yeah. We see that in Ezekiel the first time, you know, where God's throne moves and his wheels, wheels within a wheel. That's interesting. 
So the throne was ablaze with flames. Its wheels were burning fire. A river of fire was flowing and coming out before him. And thousands upon thousands were attending him. And myriads upon myriads were standing before him. And the court set. Amen. And the books were open. Not just this book, but the book of the Lamb. Then I kept looking because of the sound of the boastful words which the horn was making. I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body was destroyed and given to the burning fire. As for the rest of the beast, their dominion was taken away, but an extension of life was granted to them for an appointed period of time. Now, today, Iraq is still here today, amen? <clears throat> and uh, so is Rome. I mean, Italy's still here. Iraq's still here where Babylon is. Iran is still here where Persia was. And I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of the heaven, and one like the Son of Man was coming. And he came up to the Ancient of Days, that's Jesus to the Father, and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom, that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. But as for me, my spirit was distressed within me, and the visions of my mind kept alarming me. I approached one of those who was standing by and began asking him the exact meaning of all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. Now notice, verse 17. These great beasts, which are four in number, just like we saw in chapter 2, are four kings who will arise from the earth. But the saints of the highest one will receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, for all ages to come. Now notice this. This is what I would want to know too. Verse 19. Then I desired to know the exact meaning of the fourth beast. See, he said, now that one was different. See, the other ones are contemporary. The other ones were within a few hundred uh, years of each other, you know. And they're contemporary. They fought the same, the same type of warfare. Not like what we have today. Daniel saw what would take place in the end. Then I desired to know the exact meaning of the fourth beast, which was different from all the others. It was exceedingly dreadful, and its teeth were iron, its claws were bronze, and which devoured, crushed, and trampled down the remainder with its feet. That's what's going to happen. And the meaning of the ten horns that were on its head, and another horn which came up, before which three of them fell, namely that horn which had eyes and a mouth uttering great boasts, and which was larger in appearance than its associates. So see, it began small. He's here right now. He's here right now. But he will gain power, and he will speak out. He'll take his seat in the temple, claim to be God, exalt himself above God. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 says that very plainly. And notice, and I kept looking at that horn, that man was waging war with the saints and overpowering them. He's waging war with us. And he will until, notice, the ancient of days came and judgment was passed in favor of the saints of the highest one. And the time arrived when the saints took possession of the kingdom. And that's the stone which came at the feet of the statue. And all a man's Kingdoms were swept away, but that one grew into a mountain that covered the whole earth. And the kingdoms of this world will have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of our Savior. Now he says, Thus he said, the fourth beast will be a fourth kingdom on the earth. Now see, you can't have, these, these are the same uh, empires of chapter 2. And then chapter 8 talks about you know, Greece coming against the Medo-Persian Empire and Greece conquering the Medo-Persian Empire. So, <clears throat> these are not different. The lion is the golden head. The bear is the silver chest and belly, or breastplate. And then Greece 
is the bronze of the belly and the thighs of bronze. And then Rome is the two legs of iron. And then a revival of that was, was the feet. And you have the same thing here. During the time of these kings, God will send Jesus back and defeat them. You can't, if he's defeating the feet in chapter 2, and here it's the fourth beast, it's the same empire. It's not a different empire. It's the same empire. These are the same. So it says, um, <clears throat> Thus he said, the fourth beast, will, verse 23, will be a fourth kingdom on the earth, which will be different from all the other kingdoms, and will devour the whole earth and tread it down and crush it. As for the ten horns, out of this kingdom ten kings will arise, and another will arise after them, and he will be different from the previous ones, and he will subdue three kings. And he will speak out against the Most High and wear down the saints of the Highest One, and he will intend to make alterations in time and in law, and they will be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. That's three and a half years, or as we see, uh, 42 months. But the court will sit for judgment, and his dominion will be taken away, annihilated and destroyed forever. Then the sovereignty of the dominion and greatness of all the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be given to the people of the saints of the highest one, and his kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all the dominions will serve and obey him. And at that point, the revelation ended. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts were greatly alarming me, and my face grew pale, but I kept the matter to myself. So that's what we find. Uh, the four beasts are the same as the four parts of the statue of Daniel chapter 2. And then chapter 8, you see the war between the Medo-Persians and Greece, and Greece wins. And then chapter 11, you see the rise of Antichrist, as pictured by Antiochus Epiphanes, Antiochus IV, as a top, and it describes him. And then chapter 12, you know, Daniel wants to know what all these things mean. <laughs> but God says, go your way, Daniel, for these are sealed until the end. And we're in the end, and now the seals are broken, as we see in Revelation. So we'll uh, close now in prayer and ask a blessing on the meal. If you all rise. Father, we thank you so much for this Sabbath day and also for this season for your fall festivals, which we are in them. We just had trumpets and looking forward to atonement and then the Feast of Tabernacles. We ask, Father, that you would be with us today. And I just ask, Father, that you would help us to understand these things and that you would move us by your Holy Spirit, Father, to convict us to be ready uh, for that day, for these great and terrible day of the Lord. and great and unbelievable time of pressure that's coming uh, even before that in the great tribulation, Father. I just ask that we would be accounted worthy to escape these things and bring you glory. Uh, I thank you, Father, for giving us this assembly and for bringing us here safely, Lord, and ask that you would watch over us and protect us, you know, as we leave here today. And I ask that you would ask, bless this food, Father, for the nourishment of our bodies and we just give you glory and thanks for it all. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.